inclined to, I suppose, presume that TB is out there, but it's not their problem. But if you don't consider the risks of TB and have at least a management process on your farm for TB, you know, it is entirely likely that, you know, that you could buy in infection or that your herd will go into breakdown because the wildlife isn't being managed. Hello, I'm Cahill Summers. And I'm Georgia Lynn. Your Chagas Sustainability Advisors, and you're welcome to the Chagas Environment Edge podcast number 62, bringing you the latest information, science, and opinion to prove farm sustainability. With TB on the rise nationally, have we taken our eye off the ball in stopping the spread of this devastating infectious disease? Veterinary Inspector and Regional Manager in Kilkenny and Waterford Regional Veterinary Office. Anne Quinn joins us to discuss how TB has not gone away and how to manage farms to reduce the risk and spread of infection, how to be proactive and not reactive. Anne, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you. What is bovine TB, Anne, and how is it spread? Well, I suppose to explain bovine TB, TB is a very infectious disease, primarily in cattle, and it's caused by bacteria called Imbovis, Mycobacterium Imbovis, and it can cause disease in other domestic or wild animals and in humans as well. And just, uh, I suppose, it's hard. Uh, we know the TB is around for a long time now. Uh, and I'm just wondering, say, if an animal is infected, how long can, I know we're all used to TB testing, but how soon can it, can it be detected in an animal? Well, I suppose just to explain, Carl, first, I mean, how is TB spread full stop? I mean, TB is a respiratory disease. It's largely spread by breathing in contaminated air from infected animals. So you're looking at it's either moving infected animals into previously clear herds, contact from infected wildlife, contacted from other infected animals, or basically consuming, consuming contaminated food or sharing machinery between farms. So... TB is a very difficult disease to manage. And I think it, it, that's a part where I suppose at RVO level, we're really, I suppose, trying to get farmers to engage on the risks to their herds from TB because the incidence of TB is rising within herds. And I think it is certainly a significant risk at farm level now. And we're looking just bas- basically for a greater engagement from, from all farmers for to manage their own particular herds. And you've heard about people in the 50s and the 60s um, getting TB themselves. Would they have contacted that through animals or in another way, would you think? I think certainly there was a lot of human TB in the 50s and the 60s. And I think the BCG vaccine um, has certainly controlled human TB. A lot of the TB did come um, from from bovine TB, certainly before the 1950s and 60s. But since, I suppose, the advent of the of the eradication program, we've had that program now um, since the 60s. I mean, the, the possibility of picking up TB from an infected animal is very low. I mean, the most important thing is that dairy farmers in particular do not drink unpasteurized milk. Um, that's really at the moment the only way any human can pick up um, TB from a, a, a dairy animal or bovine. It would be very unusual to, to contact it any other way. And you hear of people, farmers, some farmers, like I know one of my neighbours in Roscommon, contacted brucellosis. Is that the same family no, well, brucellosis is actually a very different disease, um, okay. and thankfully it has been eradicated. But is a much more it's highly contagious. It's passed um, generally. It's um, venereal transmission. So pregnant animals or animals when they're calving and uterine discharges are basically you know with infected bulls. TB is very different. It's it's spread, you know. Um, in the air, it's a respiratory pathogen. But the difficulty with TB is that, you know, any it's a very individual disease process. If I put, we'll say, you know, 100 animals in a shed and they were all um, exposed to the same TB strain at the same infective dose, every animal will react differently. And and there is it's very difficult to pinpoint when each animal will become infected. And then if they're infected, will they actually become infective that they'll pass on that TB to other animals? So in relation to, I suppose, disease control or disease management, you know, brucellosis was very straightforward. Once they became infected, they basically would fail the, the blood test and they would actually pass it on very quickly to other animals. So you would see incidence of disease very, very quickly. TB is a little bit more sneaky. If an animal is infected with TB, that animal will try to wall off 
the TB within, I suppose, the lymph nodes, in, in particularly in the respiratory tract. And what that really means is they get a large abscess and they keep walling it off. And for most points, those animals actually, you know, will fail the test, but they may or may not infect other animals. You know, the infectivity large like in humans, um, depends on their immune systems. So if the animals are under pressure, you know, if they're pregnant in late pregnancy, if they're in the first 60 days post calving, you know, when they're in a negative energy balance and they're milking off their backs or as they get older, or if there's an intercurrent disease breakdown in any particular herd like mastitis or lameness, you know, individual animals with walled off TB can become shedders. And that's the difficulty with the spread of TB within herds. And then I suppose you have to consider the wildlife interface that, you know, badgers can pick up TB from anim- from animals and vice versa. So that that's another important source of TB as well. And you, you mentioned the abscess on the neck and the test. Can you just explain or, or maybe clarify for the our audience, I suppose, farming and non-farming, where we're used to coming in and maybe giving the animal two jabs and then coming back and measuring. Can you just explain that to me, what you're looking for and, and what you're what you're doing? Right. Well, we have a, um, a bovine TB eradication program in play in Ireland and we're obliged to have that for trade purposes um, because our disclosed, I suppose, TB reactors per thousand animals is such that in order to trade, we have to have an eradication scheme in place. And in broad terms, what that means is every single animal in Ireland has to undergo at least one test for TB, intradermal skin test per year. And that's called the round test. I think most farmers are familiar with the round test. They test once a year, they're obliged to test by a certain time. And if they don't get the test done, they're restricted. And that's a skin test. It's a comparative test. So it compares the reaction. It's a tiny amount of tuberculin. It's avian and bovine tuberculin that's injected. Um, the avian goes in the top injection and um, the bovine goes in the bottom injection. And it's a comparison then one from the other to determine whether or not the animal has TB. Um, but I think it's important to realise that the skin test, you know, if an animal passes the skin test, it doesn't necessarily mean that the animal doesn't have TB. It actually means that the animal hasn't reacted to the skin test. And I think that's a, a very important thing to realise for, I suppose, the round testing. You know, a test, a TB test, very well done, is is any farmer's best, I suppose, way of knowing what the infection level in their particular herd or in animals they're buying in is. So it is really important the skin test is done very well. And it's also important to realise that animals that are very early infected with TB or animals that are very significantly <clears throat> excuse me, infected, may not react as well to that skin test. So, you know, there's there's a delicate balance between, you know, a clear test is great, but it does not necessarily mean that you may, may you may also have animals in that herd that have TB, they just haven't reacted to the test. So we have a blood test that we will use then in breakdown herds. So if, an, if animals fail at the skin test, other animals in the cohort of animals from where the reactors are disclosed, we will blood test those animals. It's called the gift test. And that will pull out animals that are in early infection or animals that may not have reacted as well as we would have expected to the to the skin test. So it allows us to basically, I suppose, identify infected animals within individual herds and ideally clear um, the infected animals from that herd and get them into clearance, you know, quicker. Once the animals then... Um, once they're reactors and they go to the factory, there's this whole thing about lesions, whether the lesions are present or not present. I suppose sometimes farmers kind of wonder, you know, when there's no lesions present, they question whether there was TB or not. And is that a thing? Right. Well, I suppose I can say I worked in one of the in veterinary public health. I was actually in one of the TB reactor plants that took in the vast majority of the reactor animals um, in Ireland for 13 years. And I think we became very familiar, with, I suppose, with the predictability of TB lesions in reactor animals. And I think we can safely say that if we go back to 10 reactors in a herd of 100 animals, that's generally the best way. So you've got 10 reactors, they fail the intradermal skin test and they will be removed and sent for slaughter and they're killed separately from other animals and they go through additional checks at slaughter to check for TB, for lesions. And in general terms, we would expect if if the TB is quite recent in that herd, we would expect a third of those animals. So three to four animals should show visible lesions because if you go back to what I said first, it's a very variable disease. And the first thing any animal that's exposed to TB does as soon as they become infected, they will try to wall off that infection. And that wall off that infection will show at postmortem as a large abscess in a lymph node. 
And then depending on the time it's there, that the abscesses can be quite large and they'll spread to other abscesses as the TB becomes more entrenched. We would have specific concerns if we had those 10 reactors and um, we got 10 of those reactors with lesions. We would say, gosh, you know, there's potentially 20 more animals because a third should show lesions at the factory if it's early. So if we have 10 reactors, 10 animals that have lesions at the factory, we would have significant concerns that there's another 20 animals that are in early infection that haven't reacted as well to that test. And we will definitely go in and do cohort testing as soon as possible. And we'll be aiming to get any other animals that are infected out of the herd as quickly as possible. So no lesions doesn't necessarily mean, because I used to get the phone calls too, doesn't yeah. mean no TB. It just means early TB. Okay, Anne. Thank you for clarifying that. And we were reared on wind in the willows. I, I don't know if you remember. I won't try and guess your age or anything, but um, oh. we, we had Badger was one of the main characters in it. And um, why why are Badgers the poster boys for, for TB, for spreading TB? What Where did that come about? or what, Is that the case? Well, I think we have certainly established that the badger is a, an excellent host for TB, and and they're in you know they live in the hedgerows on every farm in Ireland, and they will pick up TB very very easily, and you certainly can get spread from badgers to cattle and back again. Badgers have a very low immune system; they're gener- they're animals that live underground, so basically they would have no defence to to wall off TB. So a badger that gets TB will die from TB. And while they're getting sick, everything that they secrete and excrete, so all of their urine, their feces, any any coughing or any discharge from the from that we'll say from their saliva and from their mouth areas will carry TB. So and, and they find it very difficult to, to eat. So they will come to farmyards, they'll come to water trucks because they can't burrow, they can't dig in the ground and they're quite sick and they will pass TB on um, to cattle very, very easily. I'd often, if I was on a farm and I saw badger activity, I'd say to the farmer, just keep an eye on it. But um, if a farmer does come across a lot of sets or a lot of activity, do they report it or what What do they do with that? Well, on the Bovine TB um, website there, it's, it's on the gov.ie um, webpage. I suppose what we're looking for is uh, it's it's the stop, stop, tell. Now, I think I suppose we'd have to say ourselves that maybe the stop, stop um, passed everyone by. And I think most farmers would be aware of a badger app and, and to inform the department. But but the stop, stop is actually the most important thing. What, what we're really looking for is individual farmers to identify the sets on their lands and to wall to fence them off so that their animals cannot come in contact um, with badgers on their farm. And then tell us by all means, because what we have is that we have a, basically a database for all the known sets in Ireland and we have a vaccination program in place. Now, in areas where there's a lot of TB, so badgers will be removed, but we do need to know where the sets are. So the more information we get, the more up to date our maps are. And basically those badgers will become part of the national vaccination program. And we our AOs will be out basically to to restrain the badgers and get them vaccinated, you know, as they as those areas come into vaccination. And are there any other wildlife animals that could potentially spread TB? Well, TB is potentially infective to to most animals, really. But the the, the main wildlife source. Um, I suppose for TB in Ireland is the badgers. Deer in specific areas, deer will pick up TB. Um, I worked in, I suppose, in a Scorthy RVO and I suppose East Wicklow would have a very, very large incidence um, of uh, TB and it would have been linked um, to, to, I suppose, deer and deer encroachment on commercial farmland. And there's been an increased incidence in TB um, breakdowns nationally recently. What would you put that down to, Anne? Well, I think I think I've been, I suppose, uh, giving this pre- a presentation to, um, I suppose, mainly uh, we have a huge breakdown at the moment in the North Kilkenny area. And certainly um, from that breakdown and from national stats, it's very clear that the numbers of reactors within individual breakdowns is is va- is really increasing. Traditionally, if we had breakdowns in any herd, whether it's a dairy or a suckler herd or a beef herd, you know, the normal figures would be three to four to five to six reactors. Um, it's not that uncommon now, in particularly in dairy herds, to have the first re- the first test disclosing twenty to thirty to forty reactors. So. While the overall number of reactor breakdowns is slowly decreasing, the number of reactors per breakdown is increasing. And there's many different, I suppose, rationales. Now, we're looking at it very closely. And I suppose it's a look at the figures and asking ourselves why. And there's 
I suppose a lot of animal movements and you know, there's a huge increase in animal movements, I suppose, with dairy intensification. I think when brucellosis um, was eradicated, I think there was, I suppose, a perception that um, the risks from TB were quite low. And a lot of the controls that we had in place for um, brucellosis were actually managing TB as well. That was, you know, there was very little movement in dairy breeding animals. Most farmers would never have bought in, you know, an older dairy animal into their herd because they would have been rightly worried about the spread of brucellosis. And then basically brucellosis was eradicated and we had dairy expansion very, very quickly on the heels of that. And the pre-movement testing um wasn't required at that point. So basically a lot of farmers just presumed TB was off the radar. So we have massive movements of, of breeding animals, which certainly does increase the risk of spreading TB. We have a huge change in farming infrastructure. You have large areas of Ireland, you know, that to maybe 2014, 2015, were in very low cattle density mixed farming enterprises. They might have had tillage. They might have had a very small dairy enterprise because they were con- constrained by quota. They may have had sucklers and some beef animals. A huge amount of those farms now have moved over, you know, to high density grazing dairy platforms with movements, you know, with major changes in the infrastructure, which has certainly upset the wildlife balance on those farms. And and certainly, you know, the badgers in those those areas in the wildlife interface does need management going forward. I think that movements of animals and and I suppose wildlife um, and access to wildlife and on, on farms is a huge, I suppose, cause of TB at the moment. And I suppose removal of hedges and that kind of thing as well would also have a knock-on effect with, with wildlife too. Well, it would, I suppose, to explain the badgers, I suppose badgers are protected and, and basically the badgers will be there after all of us really, that, you know, and so if you have badgers on your farm, it's really important to realise that you're sharing those badgers with your neighbours. You know, badgers don't recognise herd numbers. So if you allow badgers, you know, access to your farmyards, if they are infected with TB, they certainly will pass TB on to your animals. If you basically don't fence off the sets on your land and your cows or your, your breeding animals have access, badgers come out from their sets. They generally, I suppose, uh, defecate. You know, they have latrines, their toilet areas, generally within a foot of the sets. The sets are generally along high banks, you know, on ditches on most farms. And you'd have five to six badgers living in that. And they can they can generally travel anywhere from three to four kilometres, you know, in in a concentric pattern away from a main set and they'll have subsidiary sets around, you know, the, their area. But it's important to realise that you're sharing those badgers with the farmer next door and he's sharing yours. So if he's not fencing off his sets, you know, those badgers that are going into his farm could potentially pick up TB and bring it back across to your farm. So it is really important to realise that wildlife, you know, they're living there and farmers taking out to be, to be aware that if you put in a new cow road, if you put in new paddocks, you take out, you know, hedgerows. Badgers are very, I suppose, how they're a bit like the swallows. They do the same thing year on year and they will follow the same paths regardless of, of whether the hedgerows are there or not. So they will come out, they largely say to the headlands, they don't like going out into open ground and they generally go through things. So if, for example, you had maybe a 20 acre field that, you know, the farmers have taken out everything and it's now just pigtails and wire. The badgers will still run across that field as though that the hedgerow was still there. But taking out um, hedgerows also interferes with the sets for those badgers. And that that basically causes displacement and the badgers will have to move to other areas or create new sets. And that causes stress in, in the badger population. And that can make them much more susceptible to TB if there's TB in the cattle population or you've got TB infected badgers moving into areas where the badgers are clear. And that's why we're very focused on badger vaccination, because we need to protect the badgers, basically. And then for the farmers involved, it can be really devastating to the farm if it gets into your herd. And if you what, what happens then? I know we've touched on it, but what happens when you get a reactor and you know you're in trouble? What happens next with, with that herd? Well, you're restricted immediately. And a restriction is basically that no animals can can move into or out of the herd 
until um, basically the animal the, the animals have passed two tests 60 days apart. So they are the reactor retests. Now we may, so once you have reactors disclosed with your vet on a test, the report will go back into the RVO. One of our vets will interpret the test and basically confirm the reactors from the readings that the vet has put in. Now the vet will have, have tagged those animals and disclosed them as reactors to us. So largely we'll make contact with the individual farmer. We'll get the valuation process um, in place. We'll call out and we look at, you know, I suppose, start investigating, um, I suppose, the, where the disease, excuse me, the disease came from. And also, I suppose, what other tests do we have to do to ensure that we have all the infected animals? Because our, our main role is disease containment and disease control, you know, when a breakdown happens. So we're generally coming out on the farm to remove the infected animals identify any more infected animals that haven't reacted to the test yet. And we're also looking to see where did the infection come from and what can we do to ensure that this farmer will go clear as soon as possible and what steps can he take after that, that that he'll stay clear, that he won't meet us again. Because it is a huge financial cost to any farmer to lose, you know, even one animal. But when you move up to 20 and 30 reactors on a breakdown, that's, you know, catastrophic financially to any farmer. And it is really important that, you know, we manage the the, the disease process very quickly and try and reduce within herd spread. Well, what, what are the main steps that you would suggest um, to farmers in that situation and are the top tips you'd give farmers? Well, I suppose what, what I would say is that what we have generally found is that, and look at no more than, than ourselves here, I'm on a family farm, people, you know, you don't really worry about TB until you're in breakdown and by then it's too late. So I suppose what we're looking for is, is a greater, I suppose, appreciation of the risks from TB when you're clear. Because, you know, we won't meet you when you're clear. If in your standard farmer, at the moment, the incidence is running, depending on what part of the country, in about six, six, you know, six percent down to four percent in, in the lower incidence areas. But that effectively means that there's anywhere from 90 percent plus of the farming population that really won't have any, I suppose, interaction with the regional veterinary office. So they're inclined to, I suppose, presume that TB is out there, but it's not their problem. But if you don't consider the risks of TB and have at least a management process on your farm for TB, you know, it is entirely likely that, you know, that you could buy in infection or that your herd will go into breakdown because the wildlife isn't being managed between yourself and your neighbours and they're buying in animals. So what we've, we're basically looking at is that there's seven key specific risks to TB and spread of TB. And the first one is wildlife. That's your badgers and managing your wildlife on your farms and working with your neighbours to manage the wildlife on their farms and recognising that you're all in there together. And I suppose it is really really great when you have large farming areas because everyone is farming and it's a collective, I suppose, engagement to to manage the wildlife. And, and what we're looking with the wildlife is healthy vaccinated badgers that, that basically are kept separate from commercial farming animals and that they basically don't pick up TB and they certainly won't pass on TB to the commercial animals around them. The next risk is moving in animals. Now, and I think def- definitely with dairy intensification, I think the perception of the risk from buying in breeding animals has been very, very low. And I think farmers thought that, you know, look at, you know, we're, you know, a pop up dairy herd isn't unheard of now where, you know, herds are created from from cull cows from other herds with massive movements. So our research has shown that the more movements um, breeding animals have the more likely they are to fail an intradermal skin test. So moving animals is a very high risk behaviour and we'd be trying to encourage, now farmers have to buy in, but basically buy, choose carefully, you know, and try and buy animals from herds that haven't been in breakdown for at least three years because we would find that animals that go to, that's, that have had a breakdown and stay clear for three years will remain clear. So it, it's small things that you can do that will make a huge difference to your risk on your farm for, for uh, I suppose, buying in an animal with TB or going into breakdown. The next thing really would be is the, the, the pre-movement, post-movement testing. What we would be saying, the new animal health law has said that you know the animals must be either pre or post-movement tested. We would be really saying to most farmers, there is no way anyone should consider buying in an animal and then testing it in their herd because if it goes down, you've lost your trading status, you've bought in an infected animal and you have to go through, the, I suppose, the, the risk and the stress that this animal has passed on TB to your animals. So we would really be saying that you should get them pre-movement tested before you buy them. It's a little bit of extra hassle, but it is basically basically a really good strategy to prevent you know, buying in infected animals. 
The next one would be your spread from contiguous herds. I think, again, with dairy intensification, I suppose, and perception of risk, farmers are a little bit more likely to have informal arrangements with moving animals. And just to be aware that basically, you know, if you're sharing airspace with other animals, there is a very high risk that you could pick up TB from those. Your your cattle will pick up TB from those animals. So it's really important just to basically maintain a biosecure herd, have good fencing and that your animals only have access to your farm la- farmland. Oh, farmland and um, and and keep them all separate. And I suppose the next one then is your environmental spread. Now, in in some of the areas that I've worked in, I suppose TB will build up in the environment very, very easily. And they, any farmer in breakdown would tell you that the C and D, the cleaning and disinfection, is a colossal pain in the head. But it is really important to realise that TB will pass on in infected urine or faeces from heavily infected, infected animals and also in the sputum and, and the saliva from those animals. So it's just the water trucks, the feeding areas, and particularly outside, you know, to make sure that the water trucks outside in the in the fields are kept clean regularly. That if you if you are unlucky enough to have an infected animal in your herd, that that animal is less likely to cause environmental build up and infect other animals. It's just to have an awareness that regular C and D is really really important, and that ties into the shared machinery. That's another big risk. You know, everybody has contractors now, particularly in the larger herds. And it's just to have an awareness that, you know, if your your contractors are coming into spread slurry, the first, you know, the first half load shouldn't be somebody else's slurry. Just that you have good biosecurity and that the machinery and that you give those contractors access to C and D points when they're coming and going from your farm. And it just reduces your risk of bringing in TB, you know, through infected slurry or on the wheels of of those tractors and, and large machinery. And I suppose the next one and the big one is is testing. I suppose it's for individual farmers to realise that the round test, the annual TB test, is really the most important test that any farmer will do year on year. It's that farmer's only way of knowing the disease status of their herd at any given time. And if it's done properly, you know, it will identify any animals that have TB. And it will also give that farmer confidence that, you know, he's a good test done and that he knows what he has and that he's unlikely to have an explosive breakdown of 30 to 40 reactors. Because if poor quality testing, if the facilities aren't good, it's a very tricky test to do right. If you've got good facilities and plenty of help, it can be done quite well. But if, you know, if the facilities aren't great or the animals are tested very quickly, it can be very easy to miss one or two. And one or two animals that are left within a herd, particularly in the larger herds where, you know, there's very high density animals, particularly at housing, particularly when they're in late pregnancy, they're very susceptible to TB. You could have an explosive breakdown of 40 to 50. So what we would say is put a value on your test. And again, for your pre-movement testing, when you're buying in animals, you know, a good quality test is really, really important to identify animals that have TB and ensure that they're, they're removed from the herd or that you don't buy them in. And that ties in, I suppose, our last big risk is residual infection. And that that will really, I suppose, go back to, I suppose, how TB spreads and, and I suppose what how TB reacts within the body. And animals will wall off TB. So it means that animals that have gone through a breakdown that and, and the, the herd has gone clear, the longer those animals are retained within that herd, there's a much higher risk that they will go into breakdown, that they're animals that were exposed to TB they walled off the TB and as they get older, it's the same in people. TB can be an emerging disease when any any individual gets TB, you know, in their 20s or 30s. They'll, you know, the TB will be treated and it'll be gone, but it can recur when they're in their 70s or their 80s or if they become sick or require, you know, any immunosuppressing drugs. So cows are pretty much the same. The older they are, they're a much higher risk of TB. I think most farmers would have gotten letters um, from, the, from the department on, I suppose, identifying animals that have been in breakdown, you know, in the past and also older animals. And just to encourage farmers to move off those animals, to, to, you know, if you're culling, look at the older animals, look at animals that were in previous breakdowns and, and consider the risk to your herd from those animals. And I suppose that ties in with inconclusive animals. Now, I think... Inconclusives, every farmer is familiar with inconclusives. They're an animal that hasn't passed the, the skin test, but it hasn't failed the skin test. It's somewhere in the middle. And we have enough, I suppose, evidence now to to say, I suppose, categorically that those animals are very high risk, that ultimately those animals will 
eventually go into breakdown and that there's a high likelihood that they will, you know, be have develop open TB. So they will they will spread it to other animals. So what we'd encourage every farmer is that if you have an inconclusive animal, you know, on any um, TB tests that's performed on your farm, those animals should be removed. They're very high risk animals. You can retain them, but they're they're blood tested every six months and it, and they will go down eventually. But what it means is if you retain them, they're a risk to your herd, but also you're putting yourself at risk that you have this animal that's going to be tested and you'll go into breakdown at a time of the year when you really don't want to go into breakdown. You know, you'll have to go through you know, 120 days and two skin tests before you're free to trade. And for suckler farmers, if that happens in the autumn, you're tied up with weanlings. If it happens in the spring for dairy herds, you can't sell calves. So they're really high risk animals. And, you know, the best advice is to move them on as quickly as possible once, you know, once the test is disclosed. You're only delaying the inevitable, really, aren't you? If you, you are. It's, like, conclusives. it's yeah. like a grenade sitting in your farm and it's only a matter of time. And it, it, you know, and it is an awful shock for farmers because they kind of forget. Traditionally, they were retained and then they kind of forget about them. But what we can show when we go back and I suppose interrogate the data on breakdown herds, you can clearly see, I suppose, inconclusive animals remaining on farm. They will eventually go down in a test and they clearly show that there's a good possibility those animals you know, would have been part of the larger breakdown, you know, in the future because they're they're retained on farm. So really, they shouldn't be retained. Yeah, I think a clear message is don't take the risk. Have a good chat with your vet and be proactive rather than reactive um, yeah. is the big message. And look, Anne, you've been hugely informative here this morning uh, having a chat to myself and Deirdre and really appreciate it. And I think the recommend- recommendations you made have, are a huge benefit to farmers going forward. So just like to really thank you for joining us on the show today. Oh, well, thanks very much. and delighted to be here. That's it for this episode of the Chagas Environment Edge podcast. Thanks to Veterinary Inspector and Regional Manager in Kilkenny and Waterford Regional Veterinary Office, Anne Quinn, for joining us on the show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Carl Summers. And I'm Deirdre Glenn. Join us next time for the Chagas Environment Edge podcast, signpost to farm sustainability.